All of the churches during that time basically went through persecution, great persecution. But Smyrna obviously was one that either, either God just simply chose it because of what it was and, and what it represented or because maybe it went through more persecution as Christians than, than, than the others did at that time uh, that was there. But he says, I know your tribulation. And he goes down through here, and, and, and let's just skip on down just a little bit if you allow me, because like I said, all I know to do is just kind of follow this, okay? He says, I know your, tri your tribulation. And in verse 10, he says, do not, <coughs> excuse me, do not fear any of those things which are about, that which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may uh, be tested and, uh, and you will have tribulation. In other words, what Jesus or what Jesus was writing to this church and telling them is that you're going to go through a lot of trouble. You're going to go through a lot of tribulation. There's going to be people that's going to try their best to destroy you. Uh, that, is, that is there. And they went through that tribulation. They went through that trouble that was there. Um, in that and, and and this church went through that now if you read on down in here he says be faithful unto death and i will give you the crown of life now let me find this other part and y'all found out this morning i have a hard time if i don't have it marked um in this right here in in, in uh verse 10 down toward the bottom of verse 10 he said that you may be tested and that you may uh, have tribulation 10 days 10 days now some people say that that's an exact time. Well, that, that can't be the truth because they went through a lot more tribulation than just 10 days. Some people say that that represents years. Uh, and that's a possibility because there was a, there was a king, a, a, a ruler of, out of Rome, and I can't call it, I, I can't even pronounce his name, ah, something, okay, that literally for 10 years he persecuted uh, the Christians that was there and they were persecuted that right there. So that could be the case. I read that. As it was, as it was in there. But I really think in my mind that what Jesus is telling them at this point right here: Listen, you're going to go through tribulation. You're going to go through a lot of trouble. You're going to go through some hard times if you do not deny Christ. But there's going to come an end to that. There's going to there's going to be an ending point. It's not simply that something that's going to go through um, uh, for a long period of time. It's going to be there. And, and, and you know, I, I go back and I look at the, uh, the Hebrew children. In fact, I've been reading. I've started my daily, daily Bible reading this week in Daniel. And I read about the three Hebrew children that were thrown into the fire furnace. And every time you read a commentary on it or you hear a preacher preach on it, then what they say is this. God didn't take them out of the fire. He was in the fire with them. And I think that's what he's telling them in this church right here. And we'll go back just a minute and look at that, uh, that of, of what he said up there. But he didn't take them out of that tribulation. But he just simply said, listen, I'm going to be with you in that tribulation. And there is going to be an ending point to it. It's not something that is going to continue uh, continuously as far as the church is concerned as far as this church is concerned but primarily I'm going to be with you in that and he says there's going to be tribulation another thing he says about this church is this he says uh, you're poor look at what he said back in verse 9 again you're poor but you're rich now Smarta, Smyrna excuse me was rich. I mean, it was a wealthy, from what I understand. In fact, it was called the Jewel of Asia Minor. And they say that people have been over there, say that it is really still a very beautiful, beautiful place, right on the Aegean Sea. So it would be a beautiful sea court place, sea coast place that is there. It would be a very beautiful, beautiful place to be, to, to visit and everything else. And it was a very rich area. But the church wasn't. Because you understand what happened is that all of the, we found this out when we went to Switzerland. We were very fortunate to go over there. And we took a walking tour of, um, I can't call the name of it now. 
but we took a walking tour and one of the things that they showed us was, was houses and she said these are these are craft houses and what they had is every occupation whether it was a, a carpenter or a plumber or whether it was a, a, a merchant of some sort of they had they had unions and every one of them had separate unions and in order to work you had to be part of that union and I, and from what I understand, probably back in this day, it was all the same. They had, they had to work. And if Christians, and, and each one of those unions had a specific God that they worshipped. Now, as far as the town was concerned, it was, as far as the city was concerned, it was primarily a, uh, a king worship country, okay? I uh, end that right there. They, they literally set up a statue of the king of the, of the uh, ruler of Rome, and, and they, they, they worshiped that right there. That was part of their worship that was there. But each one of the, the guilds, I guess that's what you would call them, each one of the guilds had, had a specific God that, that they considered was over that guild. And they would worship that God. And, and if they didn't bow down and worship that God, they didn't work. And so that's kind of what happened to this church. Once they proclaimed themselves to be a Christian, and once they were like Polycarp, and they would not deny Jesus Christ, and they would not bow down to, uh, to those... Uh, and to, the, to those gods of those guilds, they just simply didn't work. And so therefore, the church was a very, very poor church. Now, they, they knew they were poor physically. They knew that they were poor financially. But you know the amazing thing is God called them rich. Contrast that with the last church, which is the church at Laodicea, because what he said about them is you consider yourself rich, but you're very, very poor. These people were rich spiritually because they were trusting Christ. And as I said this morning, you know, I, I thought a lot about what I said this morning about Paul. Because in this day and time, then everybody was, would have looked at Paul and said, Paul, you're stupid. I mean, why in the world would you give up what you have in order to become a Christian and go through the things that you're going through? Why in the world would you do that? That was there. Well, that's the reason they, I, and I'm sure they looked at them and said, why? Why don't you, why don't you deny Christ? Why don't you deny that? Why don't you bow down and worship right here? Listen, you can be very, very prosperous if you do that. They said, no, I have more in Christ than what you can give me there. And that's what Christ was telling them. Say, listen, you're rich because you've got me. You're rich because I can provide whatever you need provided that was there, in there. And then he says, once he leaves that area, he says you're poor. But he says you're also tormented by the Jews, which are really not Jews. Now, I don't understand all of that that is said there. But you remember what Paul said? He said, just simply because they're, they're born of Abraham, that doesn't make them a Jew. Simply because they have a Jewish character or, or, or have the Jewish blood running through them, that doesn't make them a true Jew. He says, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And so therefore, to be a true Jew, then, and, and I think it's in Romans, if I'm not mistaken. Y'all help me out, Brother David, I'm sure can. And very, in Romans, he says that the church, the Gentile church, is simply grafted into that tree. Am I in the right place? Okay. It's simply grafted into that tree. So basically, those of us that live by faith, then, and I, I, I don't know whether to say this this way or not, but basically, we're grafted into Abraham's tree. That makes sense to y'all? And so what he says right here, that these were not Jews, or they're not really, they're not really true Jews because they are, they're, they're not really true Jew, uh, children of Abraham simply because they have not put their faith in Jesus Christ. They really basically not put their faith in God. And they tormented each other like they tormented Paul. But more than anything else right here, I mean, they literally went out and just, just in the communities and trying their best to talk to destroy the church. 
And as Carl said this morning in Sunday school class, you know, you can whisper something to somebody so long until they're going to believe it. They're going to believe it, and they're going to accept it. And, and, and basically, you don't have to whisper it to them but once because most people are looking at, okay, I don't like them anyway. You tell me something bad about them. I'll, I'll be glad to tell it to everybody else. And that's basically what they were doing. And they, they were turning literally the total city against the Christians of that day. So you see, county of the, of the tribulation that they were going through at this time. But then Jesus, and let me go back. Jesus describes himself, okay? And in uh, verse 8, the very last part of verse 8, he says, these things says, first of all, the first and the last. Jesus is talking to this church. He says, listen, you're going to go through persecution, but you understand I was here at the very beginning. I'm going to be here at the very end. I'm not going to leave you. And that's one of the things that we understand as Christians that no matter what situation we find ourselves in, God is going to be in there with us. We're not going to be out by ourselves through any of that. He is the first. He is the beginning. He is the end. He's going to be there at the very beginning. He's going to be there at the very end. We can put our trust in him. We can put our faith in him simply for that reason. This whole world is going to be destroyed. Most of our leaders, to be perfectly honest with you, that think that they're in charge of everything, you give them a few years and they're not going to be in charge of anything. The Antichrist is going to come on the scene and the Antichrist is going to think, hey man, I'm going to control everything that there is. I'm going to control the whole world. And for seven years, pretty much he does, but it comes to an end. Christ don't come to an end. He is here at the very beginning. He is here at the very end. And then look at what he says also. He says, I am he that was dead, but now I'm alive. Now, I may be wrong in this right here, but again, I love the book of Hebrews. I, I really love to go through the book of Hebrews. And one of the things I love in the book of Hebrews is that he talks about Christ being our priest. And one of the things he says about being our priest is, he simply says this. We do not serve a priest that has not, and basically capable terminology, we do not serve a priest that has not suffered everything that you're going to go through in your life. He's been there. Not only has he been there, he knows, in being there, by being there, he knows what we're going through. No matter what we're going through, he knows what we're going to go through. He knows how to comfort us during that time that is there. And that's what he's telling this church right here. He says, listen, you're going to go through tribulation, but you understand I'm going to be there with you. You're going to go through tribulation, but I'm not going to leave you. You're going to go through tribulation, but you understand I know what you're going through. I understand what you're going through. There's not anything that you're going to go through that I haven't been through before. So I'm going to be there with you all the way. And that's how he describes it in, in, in this church right here. Now very quickly I'll move on because I know I'm getting too long in this right here. But he goes on down through here then and he tells them, he gives them the promise. He says in verse 11 he says, who hath an ear let him hear. And I love what he says there. I use that a lot sometimes just simply preaching. I probably used it here. I can't remember that far back. That was probably last Sunday, and I can't remember that. Probably this morning, I can't remember that far back. Uh, I think Willie was whispering something in my ear after somebody had told me something this morning. I said, Willie, if you keep on, I'll forget it before I get back there. <laughs> uh, I mean, but uh, now where am I? <laughs> yeah, I'll forgive me. <laughs> he that hath an ear. Thank you. He that hath an ear, let him hear. In other words, sometimes somebody says something, we just don't let it sink in. That's what that says, okay? I mean, this letter was going to be read to the church. But he says, listen, you're going to have to let what I'm saying to you sink in. I realize that when I stand up here and preach that to a lot of people that are out there, 
Brother David, they never get the message. They never do. I mean, they hear it, but they really don't let what they hear become part of their life. We read the Bible the same way. Okay? We read God's Word and we say that, but we never really let it sink into our life. We hear, but we don't hear. Okay? And that's what he's saying right here. He says, listen, when this letter is read, you hear it. He that hath an ear, he that is willing, that he that is willing to listen, let him hear. Then he goes on down through here and he says, um, let me find it again, okay? Uh, and this up here. He says, let him hear and the spirit of the church say, he that overcome shall not be hurt by the second death. You go to the book of Revelations, you talk about the second death. Remember this morning I talked about the books that were opened in that right there? At the very end of that passage where he says that a name was not written into the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire, and then he says, and this is the second death. Because you understand, if God doesn't come, if God doesn't return, every one of us are going to die physically. I mean, that's just part of life. We're going to reach a certain point in life that we're going to die. Okay? Nothing's going to stop that. I don't care what kind of doctors they have. And boy, they, uh, Patsy and I were talking the other day about the things that they can do now with her heart thing up here that 20 years ago you'd never heard of. I mean, they're, they're making advances and everything that is there. But let me tell you something, people. That just, that just kind of delays the, the ultimate thing. And that's it. Okay? Someday... They're going to roll you. If you're still a member of this church, they're going to roll you down this aisle, and everybody's going to come by and say, oh, don't he or she look good. Okay? Because it's not going to make any difference. That's the first death. But the second death is total, eternal separation from God. And the only way you escape that, and you can escape that, the only way to escape that is through Jesus Christ. No other way. That's it. Through Jesus Christ. And so he says right here, he says, listen, if you overcome, and that don't mean, I mean, we're not, we're not hanging outside the Noah's ark trying our best to get through. Noah was inside that ark. He didn't have to worry about it. We're inside the ark. We're not hanging on. But we're still overcome because we've overcome by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's what, that's what an overcomer is as far as spiritual things are concerned. We don't overcome in our own power and our own abilities. We're overcomers because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And I think maybe, maybe I'm putting words in this that should not be here. But I think what he's saying right here, he says, listen, when you put your faith in me, you would overcome. He who is greater, he is greater in me than he that is in the world. That's what the Bible says. So we need to learn that. Smyrna, great church. Not a whole lot written about them. You notice there's not one complaint in this church. One of the churches that there's no complaint about. All praise, all glory from a lot of tribulation they had to go through. You remember everything we go through as Christians. God has been there before, and God goes through it for us. If we learn one thing out of this right here, let's keep that in mind. Dear precious Heavenly Father, again, Lord, we thank you so very much for this day.